Hi a lot. Welcome to Winter Stock. Thank you. Hi a lot. Hi. Absolutely thrilled to have you. Um, you know, I remember last time I met you face to face. It's it's very memorable for me because it was the last business trip that I went on before quarantine. It was almost a year ago today. Yeah, it was it was last February, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, early February, and yeah, it was it was uh, obviously being the last business trip, very memorable. But what I remember most is is hearing about what your team is working on and being immediately hooked. And uh, I think it's a really exciting technology. I can't wait for everyone to hear more about it and actually have it see the light of day in the future. Thank you. We are also excited about. I am. I was very excited about our meeting a year ago. And for me, it's very fortunate that we can see each other in person. Uh, and we hope that um, this pandemic will end soon. Let me tell you a little bit about Next Silicon. Okay, so we are a startup company. I'm the CEO and founder of Next Silicon. My name is Alad Raz. I founded the company three years ago. We are around 100 employees. And we are doing a computing chip for the headphones computing a market that accelerate application. However, we are doing it in a very unique and novel way. We have a novel architecture from scratch, and I will just put it that way. There is all the other companies that are doing compute acceleration as more cores or more intrinsic, and we are doing things very, very differently, which is all about the software. Our approach is to start uh, to have the software first, the developer, the application, and then to move on. And I'm also eager to tell and expand more about our technology, hopefully soon when we go out of stealth. That's great. Um, so what kind of applications are you guys looking to speed up? Yeah, so we are aiming, um, we are not doing AI machine learning, we are aiming for the traditional a high performance computing, the classical high performance computing application, application that are written in C, C++, Fortran, application for the uh, material science, oil and gas, CFD, porting folding, clean energy, uh, climate forecasting, those are the type uh, of application that we are focused on. And we have a general purpose architecture that is tailored for those specific applications. So why do you think Next Silicon will succeed in high performance computing? Well, we are the only company that is 100% solely focused on the HPC market. We place our engineers in the mindset of the application and the HPC application. We have a unique architecture uh, that fit those workload. Um, and that's why I'm very conf confident uh, with our emerging and bleeding edge technology that we will uh, able to win that market. And speaking of the HPC market, I, I want to ask you, Rob, what are your thoughts about Lenovo in, the, in this la landscape, in a, this very competitive HPC market? Yeah. Um, you know, HPC market is a really important one for Lenovo. Um, you know, to us, it really starts with building trust, trust with our customers and trust with our partners. And by building that trust, it allows us to really engage deeply in understanding the problems and, and you know, what are our customers trying to accomplish and what motivates them or what values do they have when they're trying to think about, you know, future HPC systems. And then we can find, you know, innovative solutions with our partners to help accomplish their missions. Um, you know, and by collaborating with our partners on both, you know, hardware and software technologies that we can integrate, we can build, you know, best of breed systems that improve performance, performance per watt, you know, constantly. And keep an eye on the future, you know, so we can spot market trends, bring new technologies to market, advance the state of the art. So I think those are the things that we think about when we think about HPC. Yeah. When, when I'm when I'm thinking about the, the you, you speak about trends and performance per watt and dollar, and it's obvious now that in order to build a supercomputer that win the first um, ten position in the top five hundred rank, you need to think differently. Um, I'm seeing in the current trends a lot of heterogeneous system, 
because it's very hard to squeeze out all the floating point from in general um, processing classical volumen architecture. So you see a lot of mix, uh, mixture between a CPU that run the single thread performance well, the operating system, the interconnect and the memory, a lot of accelerator. There is a, a hot topic with respect to machine learning and AI. There is a lot of computing centers that get in fun into research those application, there are some software simulation. And I think that um, in the last essay, the, the award winning paper was how to reduce the problem set by integrating physics model into a machine learning simulation. And that was an interesting concept. It's still premature and it's still unclear whether um, some algorithm that doing a pattern matching, like machine and AI learning can help with reducing the problem set, but there are a lot of research and a lot of funds aiming uh, to, towards that direction. Um, there is a, a huge pain point in the industry when you're trying to mix and match between different vendors and that's with software. What are your thoughts then? Um, you know, how we overcome that as an industry. It's all about software. Once the software is open, one, there isn't any proprietary APIs. Once the user writes its own application and it can portable between um, two different systems, then it will be easy to uh, step out of the vendor locking. The question is which API is going to win? Because we have the classical C, C++, Fortran, OpenMP type of acceleration, MPI type of acceleration. And you can see that with the MPI. Interconnect, whether it's Rocky, InfiniBand, um, OmniPath, there was so Slingshot, there are so many interconnect that just need to implement the Shmem or the MPI API and and then you have a variety of vendors that can compete. And I think that this is where um, the future system will win. The one that it will be easy and remove, it's not just a vendor lock, but it's also compatibility. What are your thoughts about the new type of system that you're seeing in the market? Yeah, I think a lot of the efforts being put into heterogeneous systems right now, um, if you just look at the trajectory of performance and performance for watt over the last few decades it's been a pretty steep trajectory but it you know without some kind of help on traditional architectures it's it's going to start to level off and we're already seeing that and so you know lots of gpus and, and fpgas are starting to be used in different systems both in the cloud as well as in high performance computing um, centers and we think that's going to continue and there's going to be a number of different kinds of accelerator architectures that come out that have different um, affinity to different workloads. And um, we need to really optimize the system architecture in order to have a very well balanced heterogeneous compute with easy access to IO and memory and storage, wherever the you know processing is done, whether it's on the accelerator or on the host CPU. And so improving just the bandwidth like PCI Express Gen 3 to Gen 4 and Gen 5 in the near future, and then things like CXL, the Compute Express link will come in and that'll help with data flow and memory uh, transfers within the system without a lot of overhead. I think these are some big system changes that are gonna happen. They might seem like small increments, but at the end of the day, the system itself will perform very differently in the future than it did just a few years ago as a result. Well, one of the interesting points you, you, you talk about the interconnect and not just the, the external interconnect, but the internal interconnect. And uh, you, you spoke of Gen 4 migrate into Gen 5 and CXL, I'm not sure whether it will um, hold on because you have other provider, you have Intel, AMD, you have a lot of ARM system, you have Envy link into that mixture. Um, and you have a lot of chip-to-chip -chip connectivity, die-to-die -die connectivity. Um, do you think that 
moving forward, I mean, all of those interconnect is to move a lot of data and with a lot of data, there is a lot of challenges. How does Lenovo uh, take care of that um, new challenges with new computes? Yeah, I mean, I think it, on the on the buses, I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of different flavors and within any given vendor who might want to connect multiple chips together of the same brand, if you will, NVIDIA or Intel or AMD, I think you're always going to have proprietary interconnects like Quick Path for Intel or NVLink Link for NVIDIA as examples. Um, and I don't think that's going to change because it gives the vendors maximum flexibility to, you know, advance the speed, the, the width, the characteristics of that bus. But I think the multi-vendor interoperable interfaces will have to be standards and will, and they already are, right, with PCI Express. And you have others like C6 in the ARM community, which is kind of an analogous to, to QPI or PCI Express. Um, I think those will stay standards. And I think that you, know, you had C6 and Gen Z and CXL um, and others that are kind of out there vying for similar capabilities. It seems like the industry is starting to coalesce around CXL for memory sharing between chips. Um, and that overlays on top of PCI Express physical and electrical interface. So it's convenient for that reason. So I think that one will probably be the one that kind of quote unquote wins out um, in the multi-chip or multi-vendor interoperability bus. Um, but we'll see, you know, it won't be the last bus that's ever created either. So it might have its time of day and in the limelight, and then we'll move on to whatever's next after that to continue to get performance. I think that's that's my kind of prediction of how it'll play out. It seems like most of the companies are kind of lining up around that right now. Good. That's that's a great um, forecast. And um, when when Lenovo bids on such a complicated system, when Lenovo bids on a supercomputer that has this heterogeneous system, we are now talking about eight hundred watt, one thousand watts per small dimensional um, heat sink. What, what are your, what customers are looking for? What they are asking for? Yeah, um, right now it's, it's uh, as far as power goes, you're right. We're right now we're cooling 250 to 400 watt kind of range, like in current systems between CPUs and GPUs, um, some special SKUs that are kind of higher power, higher frequency. Um, and uh, we're doing that largely with direct water cooling so we can keep the density up um, and not just direct water cooling, but warm water cooling, which is kind of innovative and allows us to put in up to, you know, 45, 50 degrees C water on the inlet. And it comes out the other side, maybe 10 degrees warmer, something like that. Um, and the ability to design these, you know, direct water cool heat sinks and pipes and all that inside the system to not just hit on the CPU, but the memory dims and the um, accelerators at the same time and keep that density up is really important as we go up to, like you said, up to a thousand watts. Like who would imagine you'd have a single chip at a thousand watts? And then you think about, you might have two CPUs and four or more uh, accelerators in there, all these things consuming 500 to a thousand watts each. You're talking about a, you know, a five, 6,000 watt system. And how do you keep that in a, in a small, you know, small enough form factor that you can pack enough of that into a data center to get people the performance they want in the exascale world, right? I mean, it's a, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, beyond that, I think customers are asking for, you know, when they come to us, they want subject matter expertise, right? Most of our customers are very technically savvy. They, they know what they want. They know what they're going to be delivering to their customers as far as a computing center. Um, but they do need help on the the design and they want deep subject matter expertise to you know size and configure the system and that kind of stuff and, and help with the installation and, and we have that so that's something they value in us they want superior quality and reliability these are massive scale out systems they're very dense they're not i mean we try to make them as easy as possible to service and maintenance and all that but you don't want to be doing that right because it's actually not that easy at the end of the day and so having reliability and quality is really important um, and then finally, performance, right? So application tuning and having that expertise again to be able to go in and understand the application and figure out how to get, you know, how to tune all the different subsystems and the application configuration itself to get the most out of the system and the best performance possible. Those are, 
I think the things that we hear from our customers that they value in the interactions that we have. Um, what, what do you think about, you know, the future of exascale systems? Do you have any predictions of your own? That, what, what do you think we're going to see out there in the near and far future? Yeah, absolutely. The current trend, uh, as we spoke about, is specialization, which means that you have a CPU, you have accelerator, or you have a different software stack for, for uh, the two different. But everything we lie down the future system will be all about the software. Software is uh, the easy to use, the flexibility, supporting the developers, the fact that you have a huge cluster that runs application with hundreds of million Fortran uh, line of code. That's, that's something that it's very hard to either rewrite a lot of the new system that we are seeing today add constraints. It's very easy or relatively easy if you have the cash or the VC money to develop a new computer chip and pack a lot of floating point units. It's That's also easy. relatively easy. Just you know, put a lot of synthesized floating point units in one max, have a specialized program language that doing very long instruction set to utilize all of these floating point, and the compiler will support it. You take an LLVM backend or a GCC, um, there is intermediate representation, the lower those days, unlike 20 years ago, is much more reliable. However, in order to get or squeeze this peak performance, this is the hard part. That's why we are seeing new vendors with their own customization forcing the user to rewrite their application because they want to utilize this hardware. But this is not how I foresee the future. I foresee the, the future, um, and it's always about the envelope. That's why uh, we care so much about uh, customer engagement, early customer engagement with our partnership that I'm very uh, fortunate about and appreciate that system is um, the operating system, the single foot performance that CPU gave, an accelerator that take the compute intensive workload and change it. It's about the memory, it's about the network, about the IOs. Taking one of the components and accelerate them, moving to 400 gigabit per second, um, rather than the 100 gigabit that are common today, it used to be 25, is one thing, but that's reduced only one set of the problem. What about the CPU and the crunching? So you see 400 gig in the switches, switches in the backbone. But you need to optimize on all of them in order to get a fully working system. Moreover, there are some confusing, and, and this is the byproduct when a lot of um, um, vendors or the industry is focused on latency, how many clocks or compute is passing per every iteration rather than look on the throughput. The throughput of the system, the entire workload and minimize that can yield much more uh, benefit than a local optimization. A general purpose one, we spoke about vendor locking, easy to program, easy to debug, easy to use, easy to maintain is more important than 20 years ago when we had to write an inline assembler because the compiler weren't good enough. And this is where I see that the future uh, will be. So asking you, why Lenovo has so much interest in an early stage company such as ours? That's a good question. So, you know, leadership means staying out ahead of the pack. And lots of times um, when we listen to our customers and what they want, and we look out at what's going on in the industry, startups are the ones that often have, you know, the novel ideas and no legacy to protect. So that's like freedom to go off and innovate in something all new, right? And that, that, that can lead to great reward, obviously, for the startup. Um, but for Lenovo, anytime you want to bring a new technology or novel technology to market, it, it needs to have some momentum and it takes time to build the momentum. Right? And the best way I know to build the momentum quickly is to get started early and you know, engage with companies like yours to figure out how do we optimize your silicon and your software to run best on our platform and our platform 
you know, to host your Silicon Invest. So it's a co-optimization and, um, you know, starting early is just the best way I know to go fast. Um, well, what's your experience been like engaging with Lenovo so early in, in your journey? In the past year, um, we worked closely with Lenovo. As I mentioned before, Next Silicon is a compute company and we are focused on the compute, compute side. But with the help of Lenovo, we were able to look on the entire high performance computing stack, working with Lenovo on the board design, on the chassis, in the software, in the management software, um, the way that um, the proposal and the cell cycle works, uh, that gave us a lot of complementary knowledge that early startups such as ours tends to miss. Building a system in a reliable way, it's, it's critical to win large systems. And that's why we are very excited about all this collaboration and especially the future and what comes with Lenovo. Great. <clears throat> I got one more question for you. When are we going to hear more from Next Silicon? Well, we are in a stealth mode, but 2021 is going to be a big year for us with a lot of announcements. So stay tuned. We can't wait.